I do think that things have really fundamentally changed here and that I think the next number of years will, will be a little bit different. You know, I think we have to let the dust settle to really understand the impacts of the last two years. But I think we're in the process of fundamentally changing a lot of things that we took for granted uh, over the last really 40 year period. But I think we have to be a little bit more willing to broaden our horizons and, you know, accept things that look fundamentally different because I do think we're, we're in a much more uncertain times. Imagine spending an hour with the world's greatest traders. Imagine learning from their experiences, their successes, and their failures. Imagine no more. Welcome to Top Traders Unplugged, the place where you can learn from the best hedge fund managers in the world so you can take your manager due diligence or investment career to the next level. Before we begin today's conversation, remember to keep two things in mind. All the discussion we'll have about investment performance is about the past, and past performance does not guarantee or even infer anything about future performance. Also understand that there's a significant risk of financial loss with all investment strategies, and you need to request and understand the specific risks from the investment manager about their product before you make investment decisions. Here's your host, veteran hedge fund manager, Niels Kostrup Larsen. Adam, welcome back to the follow-up conversation you did with Jim and I about a month ago, uh, where we simply ran out of time because there was so much uh, that we wanted to cover with you. First of all, how are you doing today? I'm doing very well, thank you. Good to be back. I can't believe it's only been a month. It feels like uh, a year's gone by. I know, busy time. And what about you, Jim? How are you doing? Doing well, doing well. Uh, I, I agree. Sometimes it's, uh, they're just saying, what is it? Uh, it, sometimes it days, uh, years happen, right? That feels like the world <laughs> we're in right now. Absolutely. Time flies when you're having fun. <laughs> anyway, last time uh, we started off talking about the supply challenges of the world uh, that we're facing. And since we don't have so much time today, unfortunately, maybe just sort of five, 10 minutes for you to just recap the highlights, what the issues are in your view, uh, Adam, with, with the supply side before we jump on to more the demand side of things. Um, but also, of course, since we last spoke, uh, one big thing has, has happened, I guess you could say, and that is that the uh, OPEC Plus, I believe it was, uh, announced a significant production cut uh, and also making it very clear that uh, energy security comes at a price. So do you want to just sort of um, quickly recap uh, the supply issues and then we'll jump on to the, the demand situation? Sure. And, you know, in many ways, the supply issues have really been a long time in the making. Uh, basically, we've been under investing in the traditional oil and gas business now for for probably pretty close to 10 years. And there's a lot of different reasons for that. I think one of the reasons is that we could underinvest. And what I mean by that is, you know, starting in the 2010s, we brought on the shale oil fields and the shale gas fields. And each of those, you know, both the oil side and the gas side was the equivalent of bringing on a new Saudi Arabia. Uh, but instead of bringing on a new Saudi Arabia, which, you know, does 10 million barrels a day, took them about 40 years to ramp up to that level. We, we ramped up in the United States in about 10 years, and we did it on the oil side and on the gas side. So we had a huge, huge, huge uh, new source of supply come online. And that provided you know ample uh, excess energy into the system, really starting in the beginning part of last decade. And so that allowed us to a certain extent to underinvest <laughs> for a period of time. It allowed us to uh, not really have to be too on top of the energy supply story. And every year that that happened, it ratcheted a little bit tighter and a little bit tighter. And, you know, we're now at the point where we're spending 70% less than we were in the 2010 to 2014 period and 30% less than we were in the 2019 period, which already that was too low. So we've just been starving this industry for capital for a long, long time. And now it's coming home to roost. We've been in chronic undersupply in the oil market since the middle part of 2020. We first wrote that we're entering an oil crisis uh, at that time. It might have been a strange time to do it because oil was had been minus $37 a barrel a few weeks before. But in fact, what we were doing is we were laying down rigs, shutting in production, and we said, look, we just don't have enough excess capacity to do that. So we've been taking down inventories ever since, sort of living on borrowed time. And now we're at the point where inventories are extremely low. They're at 40-year lows, uh, if not longer. The strategic petroleum reserves, which is what the government keeps in you know case of emergencies, have been 
whittled down from, in the U.S., 700 million barrels to 400 million barrels, and they've just been announced that they're going to continue uh, to, to release from the SPRs. Uh, and we don't really see any relief in sight. You know, that this idea that the shales are going to come in and save us is, is basically turning out not to be true. The rest of the non-OPEC world is in shambles. And now, you know, that leaves OPEC and OPEC plus. And at exactly the sort of wrong time that you'd expect, uh, you're starting to see <clears throat> OPEC plus announce this massive 2 million barrel a day supply cut. And I think it's so interesting because, you know, you talk about some of the strange things you see if you do this long enough. And you go back to the summer of 2020, and you had half the world under lockdown. Oil demand was falling so fast that no one could even really measure how far it had dropped, peak to trough. And OPEC raised production. You know, it, it was the strangest thing that they could have done. But what happened was Saudi Arabia wanted to cut, Russia didn't agree with them. And so they got into a bit of a spat and they decided to both boost production. So you boosted production at the heart of COVID and you're cutting production going into the winter of 2022, 2023, when we've completely run out of oil. So, you know, cats or dogs, up is down. You know, the sky is red a little bit right now. No, no, nothing seems to be making a lot of intuitive sense. But I think that that what we know is that we have a very, very tight supply side going into the winter here. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um Tim, why don't you kick it off with uh, kind of the demand side and, and we'll just see where we go. I think we're going to go a little bit uh, wide, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I'm going to quote actually from your, uh, I think, most recent newsletter. At least I think it's your most recent. I think uh, this is particularly telling you. I mean, you this is, mind you, uh, a month or two prior to OPEC plus uh, de decision. Um Following the dual crisis of the 1970s, the United States, among others, established their strategic petroleum reserves. The reserves were meant to protect against sudden, unexpected supply disruptions, but they had a secondary feature as well. Having a strategic reserve made it difficult for aggressive states to threaten supply disruptions as a weapon, the so-called oil sword. The thinking went disrupt crude oil production, but maintain that disruption uh, for a long enough period to fully deplete the SPR. For the past 50 years, the strategy was successful and the oil sword remained sheathed. Today, given their drawdowns, commercial and SPR inventories are at the most vulnerable since the 1970s. Given the fragility of the world's energy supply, it is no wonder tyrants and despots are moving to weaponize fuel sources. What is to stop a bad actor state from pursuing disruptive actions? Who has the capacity to do this other than the Saudis? So that's that is my question, right? Uh, you know, and 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 that is your, you know, you you uh, that we got what you're saying there, right? And and the supply side is very inelastic. You've expressed that uh, several times. Uh, you know, there's the demand side, which is uh, more elastic, and then the supply side, which is very inelastic. And I think it's important to kind of paint that picture. Um, Given what OPEC Plus has done, again, you pretty much laid out the case for that starting to happen in this world. I've talked about this as well. You know, during the 1970s, uh, when 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 there's resource scarcity, uh, these things cluster. You get, uh, you know, uh, oil resource. Uh, you know, o OPEC Plus. Uh, you know, does does their thing. The wars happen, right? You get all of these uh, different inflationary effects clustering. Uh, not a surprise here, I guess, and, and you called it out right there. What do you think? Uh, what else can happen? Uh, who, what else? You know, I'm surprised, honestly, that oil is still here at 82, given that that happened. What are your thoughts uh, on that? What else uh, could potentially happen here? How bad can yep. we get? No, sure. And, and I think, look, I think the reason that we're here right now <clears throat> is that we've seen huge liquidation in the paper oil markets, and we've seen a huge amount of people positioning themselves basically for a recession and for a huge slowdown in demand. And we can talk about that. But I do think that the problems in this market are squarely right now on the supply side. You know, there's been times where really strong demand has been the driver of the oil markets. And to a certain extent, I mean, that's, that is a little bit true today in the sense that e even now everyone is getting demand wrong and they're underestimating demand. It always comes in stronger than they expect. But I do think that the, that the more acute problem here, like you said, the more inelastic side of this equation is certainly on the supply side of things. And, you know, to be clear, I'm not entirely convinced that Saudi Arabia is acting as, as a, quote, bad actor here. Uh, I, I think more than anything else, and we've written in the past, you know, we're not really sure where Saudi Arabia's total pumping capacity is. And one of the things that we've said is, if their pumping capacity is less than expected, which we think it is, 
then every time they get up above 10 and a half million barrels, you're going to see them unexpectedly rest those fields because they're pulling on them too strongly. So the last time they got up above 10 and a half million barrels is when they had that spat with the Russians in 2020. And they backed down pretty quickly. You know, it was within eight or nine months that they said, uh, you know, they cried uncle. And, and talk about an unexpected cut and pull back now. You know, I'm not really sure what data they're looking at uh, that they could justify uh, a 2 million barrel a day cut other than they have to because uh, because of the quality of their reserves. So I'm not sure, you know, I wouldn't go so far as to say that they're really trying to be antagonistic to be towards the US. I know some people do say that and, and we'll know in retrospect, but um, I think it might be something even scarier, which is the, the quality of their fields and their pumping capability. But, you know, what could we see going forward? I, I think what we could see is any number of things. You know, people have asked also, uh, I think it's happened since the last time we spoke, that the Nord Stream pipeline, uh, you know, was was sabotaged. Uh, the Russians blame, blame the West and the West blame the Russians. And, um, you know, the truth of the matter is if you kind of think through on the game theory side of things, uh, the Russians had a huge threat at turning off Nord Stream. It's not clear that it works to their advantage to actually have the thing blown up, uh, that you kind of play that card and they didn't get anything for it. And certainly the West, it doesn't really make a lot of sense for them because it leaves Western Europe in quite a tough spot. Uh, you know, I think the scary third option is that it was just some rogue, chaotic actor. Uh, and that's kind of what I mean um, when I talk about running down these SPRs, uh, we don't have a lot of buffer in the system. And so, you know, kind of anybody can have an outsized reaction if they want to uh, engage in, in, in something very disruptive. And I think all you have to do is go back and look at, you know, what the uh, Iranians did uh, to the Saudi oil fields uh, in 2019 at the Abqaiq processing facility in the Quraysh uh, oil field. They launched drone attacks. They were very targeted. They took out several storage facilities. Uh, it took out, you know, I think it was 4 million barrels a day of oil capacity. Uh, that's more than what we're talking about, you know, Russia's impacts of sanctions and stuff like that. Can you imagine if that were to happen today? That same drone attack, you know, they obviously, if they did it then, they can do it now. Uh, so so I think that 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 where it's going to come from and who's going to do it, you have absolutely no idea. Uh, but but man, oh man, you know, the, the world looks awfully... Um, awfully shaky right now you know russia uh and, and the ukraine is gathering people's attention but you know the situation in iran the situation in uh, syria the situation in some of the uh former soviet satellite states like in the various stands are, are all starting to heat up uh now too and so you know i think this is one of those things it's impossible to predict where uh, but to the extent that you lower the global buffer to be able to protect against these dislocations, just the more susceptible we are in a very complex system. Yeah, I think, um, and, and we're gonna have to dive into the demand side here, uh, right? The supply side is is um, is become pretty clear, I think. The reality is, since we had those conversations about how uh, bad the supply situation is, we've drained the SPR more. Uh, we had the Nord Stream pipeline uh, bombing, as you mentioned, or, or, or you know, attack OPEC pluses cut, right? Again, which we can argue if that's a real cut or not. And the issues in Iran, as you mentioned, right? Think about that. And that's all supply. Uh, yet oil is still at 82, right? And so well, let's get into kind of why, right? Uh, uh, and that is the demand side, right? At least that's the question, right? That, that's at least what, what, you know, must be. The way I think about it, and I think you've laid this out as well, is, is supply is very inelastic. Uh, but uh, unless that demand piece pushes, right, it can't move. But once it moves, it can move very quickly, right? There can be a big gap. So, uh, you know, the demand side is critical right now and what is, uh, you know, potentially a, a pretty volatile uh, kind of dynamic. Um, uh, you know, obviously the argument out there is is China is still in lockdown, right? Uh, and the demand side from the biggest the source of demand uh, in the world is, uh, you know, uh, a fraction of what uh, is to the point they're not even releasing statistics anymore. They just said they're not even going to release statistics this uh, in the last several weeks on on, on how GDP is. Uh, uh, you know, they're they're always questionable. Now they're not even <laughs> trying to fake it anymore, right? Um, but I mean, uh, obviously the Fed is out there trying to crush demand otherwise to to lower inflation. Um, how do you see the demand side for energy? Talk to me a little bit, uh, you know, let, let, let's start there and then I have a couple of follow-up questions. 
Sure. So look, I'll I'll start with what we're not seeing Um, in the most recent International Energy Agency data, which does operate with a little bit of a lag, but, you know, uh, a month or two, not not six or nine months or anything like that. You know, so it's fairly real time, but a little bit of a lag. Uh, Demand is still actually really, really strong. In fact, there's a big headline that they had revised down Chinese demand uh, and they did, but they actually revised up rest of world demand such that the global demand situation is actually didn't didn't change very much um inventories are still drying so demand is running ahead of supply and most importantly we still have a balancing item now i don't know if we've discussed this balancing item or not but the iea puts out monthly data supply data demand data and inventory data and presumably that all has to balance you know there's there's nowhere you know, that, that it's a tautology, you know, change in supply or, or, or the delta between supply and demand has to be explained by inventories. There's nowhere else for oil to go. And <clears throat> sometimes it doesn't. And they have to introduce, you know, a balancing item. I think they call it miscellaneous to balance. We kind of facetiously call it missing barrels because they're barrels that were produced. They weren't consumed. They didn't end up in inventory. So they're missing. You know, where could they be? And we've often written that missing barrels almost always end up being revised away by having demand revised higher. So when you get a big missing barrel number, it's usually a fairly good clue that perhaps demand is running stronger than expected. And the million, uh, the, the, the balancing item through the second quarter was running a million barrels a day. So, so if you add a million barrels to the quoted demand figure, you're really, really high. And you know, even now, even after the IEA revised down China. You look to oil numbers for next year, I think they're awfully close to 102 million barrels a day for the year next year, uh, which is really sharp, like 2 million barrel a day growth year on year. Uh, the fourth quarter for this year will be up well well through 101 million barrels. So, you know, the demand numbers as of now are still really, really strong. Now, could they weaken? Could we go into a good a full global recession? They certainly could. But keep in mind, those numbers were were released when, you know, China was under lockdown. So, so that that that's not unexpected. That's not new. That that's incorporated in those numbers, uh, and it was done with with relatively you know weak GDP uh, data. So, so I think the it's important to remember that the starting point here is very very strong demand. Now, if we don't have enough supply and with inventories where they are, at some point price is going to be used to ration demand, um, and that sort of almost has to happen. Uh, now, you know, is that bearish for crude oil? I guess at a certain point it is, but I think it's a very different story. You know, when people call and they say, well, I think, you know, prices are too high. We're going to see demand destruction and, and, and you know, oil markets are going to go into surplus. I don't think our clients and prospective clients and friends are painting a bullish picture. I think they're talking about how that would be really bad for crude oil. And I said, well, you know, take those same facts and reframe them a little bit. What if I told you that we were running out of oil for the time being, that we had a massive structural shortage. And so we were going to use price to ration what we have left. Does that sound bearish or, or bullish? And, you know, I, I think that that's the world that we're going to kind of unfortunately be in. We saw that happen last cycle as well, uh, you know, back in the 2000 to 2010 period before the shales really kicked in and there and there was a real uh, concern that we were beginning to run out of uh, oil. So, you know, I, I think we're kind of back into that world of shortage right now. Um, demand is looking very, very, very strong. It's being driven by non-OECD growth. Uh, it's being driven by continued development in the emerging market world, which is very different than demand coming from the OECD, from the West. Uh, we have a lot more demand elasticity than than the emerging markets do. Obviously, China's a big wild card. And I think some of the developments that we're seeing in China are are different than they've been in the past number of years. I listened to a few very interesting China speakers yesterday at the Grants Conference. And, you know, some of the changes that we're seeing do seem to be quite real. But there's other pockets of growth uh, and strength in the world as well. You know, we can't forget about India has come out of nowhere to be the third largest uh, line item in the IEA's global oil data. And that's growing very, very strongly. And other parts of um, the non-OECD world in Southeast Asia as well. So, you know, we, there's, there is quite a bit of uncertainty in the world, probably more than we've seen for a period of time. I think that's fair to say, uh, but we're coming from a very strong demand backdrop and a very, very tight supply 
picture. So I think it's something you just have to monitor really, really closely. Um, you know, I think it's something that uh, is not is not being priced in rationally right now. And I'll, I'll say what I mean by that in a second. Um, <clears throat> but you know, and, and I think it's largely coming from liquidation in the paper uh, in the paper markets from speculators and things like that. And what I mean by <laughs> not you know logically consistent. You know, if you really think that demand for crude is going to be hit to the extent that people are talking about right now, we're not seeing the same indications of other stress and strain in other parts of the financial markets. You know, whether you're looking at things like the TED spreads, whether you're looking at things like, you know, the future implied inflation rates and things like that. I, I don't think that the chaos that you would need to really have demand destruction enough to push this oil market into surplus would be pretty, pretty severe. And I don't know that that's what people are pricing across the board. So I think what, what's happening is, is people are really using the crude market and they're, and they're selling the hell out of the, the, the oil futures uh, and the oil stocks uh, in order to try to express a view. But looking at the fundamentals, I just, I just don't see it right now. And the other thing that, that's really helping demand, and it's quite impactful, is you know up to seven hundred thousand uh, barrels a day of natural gas to oil switching, and so there, there's a lot of capacity around the world to switch certain power generating facilities from burning natural gas to actually burning uh, various uh, crude oil products uh, in order in order to generate electricity. And so we are seeing, you know, given the fact that we have a, an acute gas shortage, notably in Europe we are seeing gas to oil switching. You know, that, that's one of the reasons why Western Europe has been able to f refill their gas inventories to the extent that they have, which has been, you know, almost nothing short of a miracle here going into the winter. And I think it's wonderful that it's happened. But a lot of that's been because you've switched from gas to oil. Uh, and, th and that's been a big, you know, tailwind to the oil market demand as well, that, that really nobody, I mean, nobody had that in their models, uh, you know, more than a year ago. I think it's, um, I'm going to kind of, uh, add on what you're saying. Uh, this isn't commodity specific. This is really, uh, in, you know, uh, inflationary. If you look at history in the 60s and 70s, uh, the reason uh, we had secular, and that's the important word, secular inflation, um, was because it was a very demand push economy. Uh, we were doing tons of fiscal uh, stimulus via the Great Society program. We had the Vietnam War, so there was tons of spending going into production to, to fund the war. Um, and, uh, you know, you had a, a, a baby boomer kind of bubble, a demographic bubble coming in, pushing demand because uh, they were in their primary household formation years. Does that sound familiar to anybody? Right. I, I think that's important to note. You know, these things rhyme for reason. The millennials are uh, a new bubble. Right. The, uh, we have. They are at 40% of, of wealth creation of where the baby boomers were at this point in their lives. And they're entering their prime uh, demand years. Not surprisingly, they're turning to politicians. This is globally and saying, hey, look, we need help, right? Uh, we can't afford housing. We can't afford A, B, and C, right? Uh, we're trying to create homes. And that's what the fiscal uh, you know, policy wave is about. Um, so uh, I think it's fair to say that, and, and we've been calling this for, for a while, any time you get a, you know, the recession that the, the, the Fed is, is trying to drive to, to cyclically, and that's another important word here, right? Cyclically compress inflation, right? Is going to be met with more fiscal to, to, to help uh, these, these, the demand side, right? Uh, and we haven't seen that dynamic for 40 years. Um, and I think people are still playing the last 40 years game. I really do. Um, so I think there's this real possibility that we continue to be in a structurally inflationary period, and we're meeting that with cyclical measures from the Fed to help slow in the short-term demand. Everybody's thinking about this in two dimensions, right? It's not just cyclical. Um, that's how we've played the game for 40 years. But these structural effects are very important. Demographics are destiny, right? You've heard that before. The reality is there are demographic effects that are going to drive structural inflation, in my opinion. And once that gets going, then people start pulling forward demand, right, which we know about. Long-term inflation expectations go higher, right? People start buying anything that has a, that's a solid asset and borrowing because real rates are, are, are negative, right? Um, so 
we're seeing this play out. People are kind of burying their head in the sand. So I actually, in my opinion, the demand side of anything, right, uh, is is going to is likely to be stronger than people expect. Maybe not cyclically, right? Because you don't, you know, you don't fight the Fed in the short term. But structurally, I think we're we're heading for a much bigger, and I'm, I'm talking over the the decade, right? Um, a much bigger push, given that the trade is getting crowded, right, and that there's cyclical issues. Uh, you know, we'll see in the short term, but I do think the long term, uh, you know, beauty of this trade is 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 very very strong. And and you know, I'll add something to that, which is something that that I don't think gets gets enough appreciation. Uh, and maybe it'll sound funny when I say that, but you know, the rise of the emerging market consumer and middle class is really, really astounding. And now the reason I say that's a bit of a funny thing to say is that people might roll their eyes and say, well, no, I hear that all the time. And you know, that seems like it's been a story now for 20 years, but I don't think people do appreciate the extent of it. So we've gone back and we've looked at all sorts of commodity demand uh, at different levels of real GDP over time. And it turns out that there's, you know, three distinct phases of economic growth in a lot of these markets. You know, you start out very, very poor, sort of subsistence living, and a change in GDP doesn't have an immediate impact on commodity demand or or really on any demand. You know, it doesn't you can extend this beyond commodities. Similarly, there's a period of time when you're really, really rich, and we all have seen that, you know, through the Fed's wealth effect in the last decade, that doesn't necessarily lead to increased consumption either, right? You, you just sort of save it uh, away. Uh, but there's this period in the middle where every incremental unit of additional GDP that you earn has an unbelievably high uh, energy intensity or an unbelievably in ho- uh, high propensity to consume. And we call that the S curve. It starts out really low and then it hooks up in the middle part and then it kind of flattens out. It looks like an S. And we've been studying that for Gosh, ever since I've been in working for my partner, Lee, we've been doing that for, I don't know, 20 years now. So why do I say it's not fully appreciated? Well, over time, there's always been relatively a consistent number of people in that middle part of their notch, in the middle part of the S-curve. It's always been about 600 to 700 million people. So, you know, Japan entered into it and then they fell out. Korea then entered into it. And so... You know, we look at it and we don't go so granular. We don't go city by city. We, you know, we take a whole country and we average, we average their GDP per capita. And we, we ascribe that to everybody in the country. So that's not 100% accurate. But I think the intuition is correct that, you know, over time, it's been a fairly steady number at about 700 million people. And now you've hooked it up to about three and a half billion people are going through that middle part of their S-curve. And And so, yes, we talk about the rise of the emerging market consumer, but just stop and think about it. This is, there's four times as many, you know, it, the impact is, is at least four to five to six, if you really want to get it, you know, if you want to add all of India, uh, as many as we, we normally experience. So we've set up a whole world, you know, that, that can accommodate 600 million people that are going through that middle-class experience at the same time. Uh, and now you're in, in the several billion people and, and First of all, I mean, one thing I will say, that won't happen again, right? Once that's done, that'll be behind us, but it hasn't happened yet either, right? We've never been in this type of an experience before. And so people have been, you know, poo-pooing the demand impact from this cohort now for, you know, the, the nearly 20 years that I've been doing this. And and I think that's been a mistake and it'll continue to be a mistake. And so that's why I say it's sort of a strange surprise but I do think that the growth of the emerging market middle class will continue to be a huge tailwind to demand. Uh, and I sound like a broken record because I've been saying it for most of my career, but people didn't get it then. And they say, oh, fine, I understand it now, but they still don't understand it. It's a huge, massive off the chart number. So uh, demand is not a model. Like the world is not a monolith. It's not one, you know, one thing, right? You could have demand in China fall off a cliff and you could have demand in, you know, the US, US go up. Um, I'd love to dive in a little bit to what potential opportunities may exist if we are entering, which seems increasingly likely, uh, some type of bifurcated, uh, you know, world where trade is breaking down a bit, but 
uh, you know, there's more onshoring and, and fiscal driven kind of demand uh, in the U.S. And, uh, and, and in other Western countries. What does that do? Where are the opportunities for that, especially given that that we're at war with Russia and, you know, pipelines only connect to certain parts? Or what, what dislocations and what opportunities do you think um, exist as a function of, of, you know, bifurcated demand or, or some type of bifurcated system? Yeah, look, I, I... – I do think that things have really fundamentally changed here and that I think the next number of years will, will be a little bit different. You know, I think we have to let the dust settle to really understand the impacts of the last two years. But I think we're in the process of fundamentally changing a lot of things that we took for granted uh, over the last really 40 year period. And I think that includes ever decreasing bond yields, ever increasing bond prices, things like the 60 40 portfolio, things, you know, like increased globalization. Uh, and certainly no one's traded this type of a market going in the other direction. And I think a lot of people haven't really even thought about it. And so um, I'm not going to, you know, pretend to be the one with all the answers. And, and and a lot of these things have different cross currents. But but I think we have to be a little bit more willing to, to uh, broaden our horizons and, you know, accept things that look fundamentally different than have than have been the case, because because I do think we're, we're in a much more uncertain time. So look, the, the, the simple answer is that we're going to need more things. You know, we're going to need more resilient supply chains. We're going to need more resilient natural resource supplies as well. You know, it's not going to be a question of oil. It's going to be our oil and their oil. And people are probably going to want to develop more, um, you know, strategic stockpiles, although we seem to be going in the opposite direction there. But hopefully that, you know, goes back the other direction. I think you'll see resource nationalism uh, you know, I think you run the risk of export bans. I mean, you're seeing that already in certain things on, on the crop side. Um, you know, th there's the threat of export bans in, in energy markets. I don't think you're going to see them quite yet. But I think if, you know, U.S. natural gas prices converge with world prices, I think, you know, Biden administration could easily end LNG exports. It would be disastrous for Europe, but I think it could certainly happen. So, you know, all of that leads to reduced efficiencies uh, across the board, and, and that should result in more demand, all things being equal, right? Because you're, you're not able to run such a lean supply chain. Uh, of course, the flip side to that is what does it do to growth? And does it impact global, you know, potential growth to the point that that offsets the demand? I, I don't know. I mean, and that nobody knows. Um, so I, I think we'll have to wait and see on that. But I think certainly what it's going to do first and foremost in the short term is it's going to really uh, decrease efficiencies and it's going to, you know, increase the needed redundancies uh, across the board uh, it, it, because we are going to enter into a situation where it's sort of going to be, you know, our oil versus their oil and, and, and things of that nature. Yeah, that's a that's a very interesting point that, that people will, in a more insecure world, that people will need to build their buffers and that is an incremental source of demand. Uh, that's a very interesting point that I hadn't really uh, considered. I do find it interesting. Last time we spoke about the gas, right? Uh, Europe versus the U.S., the dislocation we've seen, and how there's a little bit of catching up. But obviously, you would expect that those two kind of converge over time. I do think, uh, in particular, when we talk about demand, the demand side uh, in the U.S. is actually not only uh, strongest, but it's also uh, likely with more onshoring, right, with the increased bifurcation, likely to increase. So there's a compelling reason why. Uh, on the demand side, at least, that that those two things should uh, normalize uh, as well. It's a beauty of free markets, uh, uh, especially over time, right? That takes a bit of uh, time. But I, I do think that is a very compelling trade over the medium term, um, as you've highlighted as well. Yeah, yeah. Look, you know, I think you talk about demand and, and um, Lee and I just gave two speeches over the last two days. So I'm going to pull pull from a little bit of everywhere. But, you know, the, the truth of the matter is here that so so Europe is in a real predicament for this winter, particularly as Russia shuts off its its gas. Now, bears might say, well, look, you know, I don't know what everyone's talking about. Germany's at 90 percent filled in its inventories and things of that nature. And yes, it is. But it did that in a number of different ways. I mean, first, it shut down 19 percent of its industrial output. The second is that it switched from gas to oil wherever possible, which is not really feasible given the oil inventory situation now. It burned a ton of coal, which nobody wants to do, but you know, but that that did happen. And but I think the most important thing that everyone seems to forget, that happened with the Russian gas flowing 
you know so so everyone's patting themselves on the back but but they hadn't had this supply disruption until quite recently and so yes uh, germany was able to fill its gas reserves and I, i'm incredibly happy that they did so um because i think that it gives them the best position here uh to go into the winter but we do forget a couple different things you know first and foremost all through a winter withdrawal season, I think people are sort of thinking, okay, you have this inventory level, that's there. And now every winter we just draw that down. But you forget that you also inject into it. You you have supply, right? So it, it's a buffer. If your supply is disrupted, that inventory comes down in a huge, huge hurry. And the truth of the matter is that Europe will succeed or fail this winter really based upon the weather. And, you know, we're 2022 and, you know, firewood from the United States is making its way to Europe very, very quickly. And everyone is sort of hunkered down and saying, well, let's all pray to God that we have a nice mild winter to see it through to the other side. I mean, this is like medieval times. This really shouldn't be the case. You know, it's 2022 and it's Germany. You know, th these are modern times and incredibly sophisticated countries full of engineers. And so, unfortunately, we're, we're in still a very precarious situation. And, you know, the fact that U.S. gas prices haven't converged with European gas prices and the fact that European gas prices have backed off here a little bit, uh, first of all, I think that's great that that's happened. You know, it's not necessarily great for gas companies, but I think it's very important for Europe that, that we have been able to fill inventories and we've seen a little pressure come off. But nothing has fixed this problem. This is an incredibly systemic problem. Uh, and, and it's very, very, very dangerous. And so I think, um, you know, U.S. gas prices haven't converged with European prices. Uh, okay, fine. But, you know, the truth of the matter is you still have United States prices for natural gas that's basically, call it, you know, 20% of the cost of gas elsewhere in the world. And that arbitrage just can't persist over over the long term. And, and something will find its way to, to close that. Let me let me interject here and just ask you a couple of things. Um, obviously, from a European uh, perspective, being based over here, uh, now I hear talks about the fact that we have to, um, decreased our demand. I mean, people are being bombarded uh, and and rightly so with advice as to how you can save. Some people simply can't afford to have their heating on, and and that in itself obviously drives down demand. So my first question is. Do you have any numbers? Are there any statistics out already showing if there is a real um, kind of um, lower, you know, is there less demand already that, that, that shows up from what we're doing over here in Europe? So I think the numbers, you know, that I've seen uh, really revolve around uh, the uh, industrial capacity furloughs and things of that nature. And I, I had read, you know, somewhere in the 15 to 20% range and that potentially could get as bad as 30 to 35% uh, throughout the winter if in fact, you know, Russia cuts off supply and and weather doesn't cooperate. So, so you know, that would be the, the hardest number that I've seen. You know, natural gas demand is difficult to model because there's there's a number of different variables, including the weather. Uh, and so, you know, we don't tend to have the same real time uh, model data on uh, on the gas side that that we would on the on the oil side. And so, I'd have to go back and see, um, you know, what the weather has been like the last several weeks. Make those adjustments to demand in order to get to the, you know, sort of core, um, what I would call, you know, what would that be, you know. Uh, actual sort of impact uh, on demand from, from people trying to be proactive going into the winter. Sure, sure. I mean, that, that that's fair. The other thing I was curious about, you talked earlier about, you know, um, sort of the oil side of things. And I guess um, one thing I'm not entirely clear on myself, and that is, has the way oil is being traded changed, meaning is Russia essentially moving its oil supply directly to China and then Europe, we're still just, oh, maybe to, um, how should I put it? Maybe we are now more focusing on getting our uh, oil from, from the Middle East or has there been some kind of shifts? Because the reason I ask is that, and, and this is, I don't know if you could say it's conspiratorial or, or whatever it is, but there are people talking about that all of this conflict is somewhat tied together, meaning, are we really just focusing on on Russia? And if we 
if we bring them to their knees, and I'm not saying we are, but if we were as, as the West and, 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 and we were to uh, damage their, say, oil uh, ability to supply oil, we would then actually indirectly damage China because then they wouldn't be able to get the energy they need and so on and so forth. So there are many players in all of this. And I'm, um, I'm interested in, in, in what you see because you follow these flows and I'm not sure whether they have changed or, or not. Sure. And, and first and foremost, I will, you know, it's important to know what you know and know what you don't know. And I'm not a physical oil trader. And so I'm sure you could get somebody from Glencore or Vital. I don't know, maybe you have to distort their voice and put a black square over their face. I don't know if they, <laughs> they're willing to talk or not. We but, can do that. But, um, you know, th th those are the guys that really do see the flows move around. You know, I think I think the story uh, anecdotally is that uh, a lot of Russian volumes are moving to China at fairly wide discounts and fairly wide margins. Um, you know, so I, I tend to avoid some of the conspiratorial sides of things. And, you know, I remember it was before I was uh, active in the markets, but, you know, when the when, when the United States went into Iraq and everyone said, oh, it's all for the oil fields. And I mean, you know, I haven't met any Iraqi American oil tycoons that made out like bandits after, uh, you know, those actions either. So I, I, I think that that is probably best to stay away from some of the conspiratorial things. But the truth of the matter is that, you know, the actions, at least to date, have resulted in China being able to buy oil, you know, 30 bucks probably below the spot price, which, you know, as of today, uh, is below the price of crude before Russia invaded the Ukraine. So, you know, there's probably actually a big windfall uh, to China and, and probably to India as well, who's been very I would say strategically ambivalent in this whole thing and kind of playing both sides off the middle uh, to a certain extent, probably because they are buying a lot of uh, Russian uh, crude. So look, I, I think that the truth of the matter is <clears throat> when you look at, at energy flows from Russia and you look at the potential disruptions in the market, more disruption lies in front of us than has actually occurred to date. You know, if you look at, you know, sanctions, if you look at, you know, stopping the flow of Russian crude, you know, that that's all due to really take place at the end of this year. And, and similarly with the gas side of things, you know, until Nord Stream was uh, um, sabotaged a uh, week or two or three ago at this point, you know, m Russian volumes into the Western Europe uh, were basically unchanged. So, you know, I, I think that all this disruption and all the potential havoc and all the potential conspiracy theories and everything like that, most of that does lie in front of us as opposed to behind us. And I think that is something that um, that, that people would be uh, well advised to, to appreciate. I know we have a short uh, timeline here, but last thing here, if we're getting to the elections, I don't think that's that's not an uh, inconsequential thing here in the U.S. Right? <clears throat> I actually, uh, to your point earlier, I don't think the OPEC Plus move was. I think it was more because it, of the timing of it. Uh, but we don't have to get that go down that rabbit hole. But the midterms matter because after the election happens, that frees up policy in the U.S. to change, uh, right? In some ways, uh, not only because you'll have likely an incoming change of leadership, but also politically certain stances that uh, the current administration has, uh, they may have to hold for political reasons, which all of a sudden when there's now a two-year window they can shift on, um, aka the Keystone Pipeline uh, would be one of them, right? These are types of things, you know, more supply-side responses from the U.S. that are less environmentally friendly, I think are probably more likely after the election. Other than that, do you see any other kind of, again, I'm trying to give contrary, uh, you know, be polemical here and, and give a little bit of the potential bear case to what can go wrong. Uh, what is the timeline? And, and why do you think that's that's not that important? Um, also, you know, I'd love to get your opinion on LNG distribution. How long does that take to, sure. to change, uh, you know, to actually rebalance things, et cetera? So first of all, you said, you know, what could go wrong? And, and why am I not worried about it? And why is that not important? And I think you really underestimate how much I worry about things because I, I worry about what could go wrong all the time. Uh, but <clears throat> look, I, I, I think that um, first and foremost, from a policy perspective, okay, there has really been to date nothing that the administration has done that has suggested any type of a 
uh, cozying up or any type of a, an understanding to try to support the oil industry at all. You know, people had asked me several times, well, now that, you know, now that the administration gets it, now that things are so bad and they're, and they're trying to uh, help the energy industry, you know, what's that going to do? I mean, that, that has not been the case until yesterday. Um, you know, the talks have been about banning exports, have been, been about super normal profits, have been about uh, lowering taxes on gasoline, which helps the consumer but does nothing for the oil company. Uh, and if you look at all the rhetoric and all of these sort of soft power things like Biden snubbing the oil companies, invited them out to the White House, and then he refused to see them because he saw the wind companies at a different meeting at the same time in the White House. You know, so so everything has really been antagonistic towards the energy business. There's been nothing that has been favorable. Yesterday, you could argue, was perhaps the first time that anything was said positively and, and, and what the... White House announced was that they would look to rebuild the SPR at between 67 and $72 a barrel. I have no idea where those numbers come from. They seem very strange to me, but anyway, um, between 62, 67 and $72 a barrel, there'll be buyers of crude, you know, presumably to refill it. So that's 300 million barrels, million barrels a day for a whole year, 2 million barrels a day for six months, big numbers uh, at 67 to 72. And they actually did include language that said, you know, so that should give producers comfort that the price can't really drop below that. And so there's the idea that there could be a, um, you know, the Fed put might be gone, but now you have an oil put. Uh, and so that was the first thing that I could really point to that wasn't, you know, a, a, a backdoor antagonistic thing to the oil industry, you know, like, like, for instance, saying, you know, oh, we'll get more production because we'll tax the hell out of these guys if they don't invest. I mean, that's not very, you know, favorable to the oil industry. So, so, so maybe there's a beginning of a change there. Uh, but I think it's a little bit early. And maybe I'm, I'm showing my politics, but I, I wouldn't give them the benefit of the doubt just yet. But that is, that is the first thing that has been done that could be considered a positive uh, from the administration. So we'll have to wait and see. Uh, after the election. And as far as LNG infrastructure goes, you know, we do have about two Bs a day coming online in the next kind of 12 to 18 months. Uh, after that, I think we go in a little bit of a lull. Um, we've, ne we've never really tested how fast we can build these things. They are big and costly. Um, but, you know, we do have a history now, sort of a 10-year history in the United States of, of building them. So we're not starting from scratch anymore. Uh, how fast could we get them permitted and built? My gut feel would be, you know, 24 to 36 months if we really threw, threw a lot at it. Maybe you could go faster uh, on some smaller scale projects, uh, but it's not going to be overnight. It'll be, it'll probably be a couple of years. Um, and then as far as, you know, what, what really worries me, um, <clears throat> you know, people talk about a recession and how that's going to impact demand and things like that. And looking at the numbers and looking at the backfill from these non-OECD people coming through their S curve, that doesn't worry me so much. I think the supply side is actually so bad that that um, the market will stay tight, even if that happens. But what would worry me a little bit more is, is you know, the likelihood of a, of a large systemic shock, um, something along the lines of the GFC. And, you know, given the fact that <clears throat> there's so much leverage in the system, and given the fact that you know, bond durations were so high going into this and interest rates are rising. I mean, it does strike me like there's the potential somewhere in the system. Um, and we obviously had the UK pension issue take place a couple weeks back. And in retrospect, that'll either be isolated or that'll have been the, you know, Bear Stearns moment in this cycle. Um, so that that worries me. Um, that worries me. I think in that type of a situation, also, frankly, resources snap back faster, kind of like in 08, where they came back a lot quicker in 09. But, I mean, there could be a massive leg down to everything uh, if something like that obviously happens. And I think the likelihood of that, you know, the doomsday clock has probably moved forward a little bit. Now, Adam, um, again, like last time, we didn't quite get to all the things we wanted to ask you about. I mean, there are things like other commodities, copper, there are the whole food crisis that I also thought we were going to get to. Um, so we're obviously going to have you back soon uh, again. And also, actually, I do think it's worth talking a little bit further about certainly in Europe, where they just over a weekend kind of decide, yeah, let's just get all the, uh, you know, super uh, normal profits from these energy 
companies to pay for all the other social spending we want to make. I mean, there's some huge problems uh, or issues, let's call it that. So we'll definitely have to um, to get you back um, before Christmas if you have time. But I know there is a chance for our audience to uh, to check out uh, more of your information because you're um, you're having a conference soon. So tell us a little bit about that before we uh, we close out today. We are we are we're having our second annual Investor Day Investor Conference on November the third in New York. We have a virtual option, uh, and we also have an in person option. And my preference would be to see everybody in person. Um, as much as I enjoy talking with you guys virtually here, it would be nice to do this all in person one day. So if anyone's in the New York area or planning to travel, please do come. Uh, and, and for those uh, who cannot, uh, please look at the virtual options. Both can be found on our website, gorosen.com. We have a very, very good lineup. You know, we decided to really go big this year. And not only will you hear from hour after hour after hour of Lee and I, but um, we also brought in some of the people that have really been instrumental in forming our views. And you can kind of hear it primary source, you know, and hear all the ways that we got it wrong and things like that, you know, that we mis misunderstood what they were saying. Um, so anyway, that I think it'll be a great event. And, and um, yeah, please go look at our website uh, if you're interested. Yeah, definitely would encourage everyone to do that. I can't wait to uh, to see what comes out of that uh, for sure. In any event, you should definitely follow and subscribe to Adam's work as well as to Gems, of course. And uh, as you can tell from today's conversation, we are living in a true global macro energy driven world. And it is perhaps more important than ever before to stay well informed. From Adam, Jim and me, thanks so much for listening. We look forward to be back with you as we continue our Global Macro Series. In the meantime, take care of yourself and take care of each other. Thanks for listening to Top Traders Unplugged. If you feel you learned something of value from today's episode, the best way to stay updated is to go on over to iTunes and subscribe to the show so that you'll be sure to get all the new episodes as they're released. We have some amazing guests lined up for you. And to ensure our show continues to grow, please leave us an honest rating and review in iTunes. It only takes a minute and it's the best way to show us you love the podcast. We'll see you next time on Top Traders Unplugged.